believe, episode eight of Performing the Arts of season four. My name, as always, is Brian M. Davis. Thank you for, oh, thank you for actually joining me today. Uh, both through those who are watching, those who are listening, um, as of right now, I have no idea if by this point I've actually had this stuff on Spotify and other podcast forums. So if you do, thank you for, uh, for listening this week, or this episode, I should say. Uh, joining me today is actually a, a former co-worker of mine yeah former co-worker of mine i haven't seen her in a couple of years uh glory kagan uh, i first met her in the summer of 2017 when i was actually working for a mutual friend of ours ray levine who is a great set designer and we were working on the i think it, it was the planet connect uh, your uh Theater company, well, theater, uh, theater production company, yeah. well, theater, blah, theater studio. Blah. There we go. Your place of business, Planet Connections. We're doing a, I believe, the last, uh, the last thing of the season. So it was like the big fundraiser thing, and I was there as a set design assistant. So it was actually pretty fun to actually do a lot of that stuff, especially for big fundraiser at the show, which I never actually done. But yeah, I haven't seen Glory in at least a couple of years. The last time I saw her was actually in, I believe, 2019. Yeah, May 2019, or around that area. Uh, and I had just gone to see one of her shows that she just directed. Uh, but yeah, enough about how I know her. Let's talk about how you got into theater. So I know it's I know it was a long story when you told it a couple of, a few years ago or at least somewhat like that. But yeah, Glory, how did you get into theater? And yeah, yeah, or, how did that happen? Or, well, first of all, thanks for thank you for doing this, Brian. Oh, I of course, think it's it's really great that you uh, that you're doing a podcast in general. And thanks for inviting me to be a part of it. I appreciate thank you. that. If it wasn't um, if it wasn't for the pandemic, I wouldn't have had gotten this show off the ground. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> a blessing in disguise yes. here. Um, yeah. So uh, well, I, my mother was in the theater, and so I grew up around it from an early age, um, and uh, it was just a natural uh, transition for me. Um, and, uh, yeah, I had been in New York, uh, for a little bit and then decided to, uh, form, um, Planet Connections, which pretty much is organized, uh, similarly to how the Fringe is organized, except that yeah. every, um, every production benefits a different charitable organization or philanthropic organization. Uh, so to present within Planet Connections, you would need to partner with an organization of your choice. Uh, so over the years, I mean, we've partnered with maybe over 300 different organizations, things like Safe Horizon, New Yorkers Against Gun Violence, City Harvest, um, the Ali Forney Center, um, yeah. these kinds of organizations to raise awareness um, for different uh, causes. Uh, and a lot of times those organizations would come down and speak uh, and you know, work in conjunction with the artists mm -hmm. who were creating a play or musical of some sort. Um, and uh, once a year, Planet Connections would throw what you were describing, which is our annual Playwrights for a Cause benefit, in which we would um, we would focus on raising awareness for one particular organization. Um, I yeah. think the last one we did was for the Alley Forney Center. And, you know, we invite some renowned uh, writers, uh, you know, like Lucy Thurber, Hallie Pfeiffer, uh, Kat Few, Regina Taylor, uh, Migdalia Cruz have all been involved. Um, and they work alongside um, writers who might not be as renowned yet, uh, but sort of came up in in the Planet Connections community, uh, like Gabrielle Fox and uh, Penny Jackson and and so forth. Hmm. Uh, 
when it when it came to working with a, a lot of these people, especially those who are essentially both up and coming and also those who are uh, veteran play uh, playwrights. Uh, uh, to those who were essentially up and coming is like, did they still, and and this is the same problem I have as playwright too, is where it's just like, oh, my play is going to be in a play festival. How much of my play is actually going to be uh, the same play? Because I know when directors get a hold of the play, it's like, hey, you know what? We're going to have to cut up a couple of parts because it, it's, it's, uh, it's almost standard procedure in a production where it's just like, we have a play, we got to do a run through of it, or at least some some read throughs of it, and then the director and the playwright they might go over some stuff and say, okay, this this section might have to go out, this section might be kept in, but at least cut off a lot of it, especially with this being a fundraiser because you know fundraisers are just, uh, typically you know one night only, unless you have like a, a two two night fundraiser that sort of thing too. Uh, mm. Much of these plays, especially those who are essentially, you know, new plays and especially the old plays, how much were they kept in essentially, um, you know, production wise, where it's just like, hey, you know, you only have a limited amount of time, even though it's, a, you know, two, three hour fundraiser thing, but the play itself is like maybe 15, 20 minutes. So we got to work what we got to work with. If that makes the question uh, sense. Yes, that, that would be different from year to year. I mean, Planet Connections was operating as a festival for 10 years. Yeah. And then just as a company for two years, producing a season of work uh, before we hit the pandemic. So, um, and also it had different artistic directors at different times. I was not the person uh, running Planet Connections um, in its latter years. Yeah. It was more just uh, 12, 11, 10 years ago when I was founding it that I was I was I had a little bit more of a voice in some of these things. <laughs> um, I think uh, that that uh, a lot of times within the festival, people were producing their own um, their own work and we were presenting it. So we were not really interfering with what they were electing to do. Um, yeah. However, later on, there were more, there were other artistic directors uh, who came on board, who actually went and would meet with uh, the writers and the teams and see run throughs of the shows and give notes before they, you know, who were interested in it. But some artistic directors later on were more interested in actually hands-on development of what was happening in the festival. Um, and so that did go on for a little bit. Um, and, you know, every artistic director was different. So, I mean, it's hard to say, um, but I think, um, you know, that was kind of uh, what, that's what our, uh, is within an artistic director's realm is yeah. with their on it as artistic director how much they want to get involved with that you know yeah uh when it comes to festivals and as i mentioned it being like a, a one night only thing or something like that and it, it does involve a theme related to the sponsorship or at least the <clears throat> the oops, excuse me for a second there we go it involves the theme to the cars for the for that play uh, for that festival or you know for the you know for the uh, let me start again. Yeah, for the most, yes, for the most part, um, for playwrights for a cause, definitely writers were writing new short one acts uh, based on a certain theme. So, for example, when we did New Yorkers Against Gun Violence, you know, we had Dominique Morisso and um, Israel Horovitz and Regina Taylor uh, and people write for the specific theme of gun violence yeah. and what they thought about that. Um, so playwrights for a cause uh, were more curated, uh, you know, specifically for a a um, 
a topic, but in terms of the festival itself, I mean, because anybody could could apply yeah. to do the festival, and we had a lot of different financial uh, tiers. And in fact, we gave three scholarships a year, meaning that you didn't pay any fees or anything. We we're just presenting you, um, just so that we can include people who were financially hardshipped in some capacity and make sure their voices were still being presented. Um, I think that um, for that, the groups really determined for themselves how much their actual piece was aligning with the organization and that they elected to benefit. And sometimes it was really aligning and sometimes it was a little sort of, hmm. but yes. it was at the end of the day, I think what Planet Connections did was it attracted a lot of activist artists and when I arrived on the downtown theater scene, there was not a place for activist artists. Most of the festivals that you went into were really geared towards uh, getting your show to Broadway and getting yourself into the commercial. It was like a bunch of people yeah. trying to get in commercial theater, as opposed to the idea that there might be some people who are interested in the theater for other reasons than being commercial. Uh, not that they couldn't be commercial or still be interested in those things, because some of our artists are, and some of them work commercially. Um, but more this idea of nurturing activist artists, um, attempting to attract activist artists, because someone who's not an activist artist would probably just be like, what, you want me to partner with an organization? No, that's yeah. not for me. And then move on to some, some other place. Um, so I think that we took in and nurtured people who were interested in the arts in an activist type of way. Yeah, uh, I remember some of the stuff that I, I, even though this was like a few years ago, I vaguely remember the stuff that, well, the stuff that I was actually watching the crowd and I'm like, oh, this is actually pretty good. And I remember seeing this, and I do remember seeing the stuff that you always, uh, Promote, which is something I will want to get into in a little while, which is producing, especially because you did bring up a good point. And this is here, me, this is like literally generally me switching up topics in the middle of the topic. But anyway, uh, what I do want to say is that with Playwrights for a Cause, I believe with whichever play or topic you were doing for that night, especially if it was like, say, what you just said before, where it's like, oh, the topic sort of is hand in hand with the topic itself, but at the same time, the play doesn't really hold that topic, you know, uh, hand handily, so to speak. So yeah, it, it's, when it comes to festivals and stuff like that, you know, I submitted our work, play, uh, play festivals, that sort of thing too. And, you know, it, it's weird how festivals, especially, or a sense of what you just said before, where, where it's just like, they have this idea or a theme and it's like, and it's really hard to work with a, th a theme almost like throughout the play, because, you know, I've only have like maybe one play that I wrote that has like one theme, which is essentially about the five stages of grief and, you know, shopping that play around, especially for something that's like maybe 45, you know, 45 pages to probably an hour length of a thing. That's kind of hard to do, especially if you want to, you know, I mean, nowadays I could probably, you know, try and do it over Zoom, but even then, oh, and, you know, uh, Zoom theater, which is uh, something I want to go into later. That's a whole discussion by itself because I know I talked to Joyce Miller a few episodes ago, and she was talking about how it, you know, how a lot of the stuff that she had done prior to the pandemic was basically uh, switched because of what was happening. But anyway, that's a discussion yeah. later. So what I was trying to say before was that when it comes to festivals here, yeah, I do understand that there are, it, it's like very hard for the playwright to shop around their plays when it's like, oh, you know, you know, today's, you know, not today's festival. Yeah, today, you know, this festival is, this festival's theme is all about love. Okay, I have, but what they're talking about love is like the, the actual love of someone who has lost someone 
not not so much, has lost something and now has like gained their feeling for love. And like, it'd be like, do we, do we even have a play like that? And like maybe in, all right, let me, let me see if I could write up a play just about that sort of theme. And, and it's weird because I would send out the, those stuff and be like, well, you know, this is the type of theme we're looking for, but I don't think this is the type of play we're looking for. So it's like, it's really hard to shop around plays and that sort of thing too. But back to my original thought, the stuff I've seen at Playwright Tarot Cards has always synced up rather well to the, the cause for that night. So yes, in a very long-winded way of trying to say, <laughs> trying to explain that, the plays I've seen at Planet Connections, especially for Playwrights for a Cause, has always been synced up rather well. So especially for something that's that's going to be, oh, for one night only, and you may only have like maybe a couple of weeks to set everything up, which is another, yeah. which is another thing I do want to talk about, rehearsal time and stuff like that, because I know a couple of years ago, you have essentially like maybe, and I think you still do this too, which is, I, I believe you do like maybe six or like five or six productions a season. And then at the end of the season, which is the big you know finale, playwrights for a cause, you know, <clears throat> the fundraiser. In terms of the fundraiser, how much time is that devoted to, especially going into like say, it being one night only a lot of time goes into it i mean it's something that the planet connection staff is talking about months in advance um and you know is included with their their contracts and then of course we also take on people to work just for that event because we don't have enough staff to cover an event that large um in house so um yeah it uh it does take um a lot of people and a lot of manpower and i mean there can be 80 people working on playwrights for a cause when you do it um when you count all the designers and actors and writers and directors and yeah. um all the backstage crew because it requires a backstage crew and all the front of house crew marketing pr it's you know there's a lot that goes into producing an event of that type um and uh yeah but we have managed to pull it off successfully you know for uh, for six seasons we did that um and um you know it was um uh, it was it was a uh, challenging at certain points because uh, when we first started doing it, we didn't know how to connect it uh, with the festival artists. And it, so that was something that sort of came in time, um, finding roles for some of the festival artists, finding slots for some of the festival writers, festival directors, um, and, and sort of bridging uh, the worlds a little bit. Um, you know, so that was something that we we worked on over time, I would say. Um, but I think also um, maybe I might talk a little bit about, you know, breaking into directing because that's something sometimes people are interested in. Yeah, and I do um, want to, I do want to ask, how did you get into directing? Because I know there are a couple of things or at least a couple of productions within Planet Connections where you actually could do, produce and directed your own work and yeah I remember so I th yeah. um I think oh well go ahead go ahead you go ahead yeah yeah uh, I remember one of those things being a, a stage reading a couple of years ago actually uh I forgot where but it may be in not Soho uh the Lower East Side or somewhere like that and it was it, it was interesting to watch a play being directed and you know from a, a play as a stage reading because a stage reading because a stage reading has always feels a lot different because you you know as an actor you have the words in front of you so you don't have to worry about all, all these choices and stuff like that but still you're just kind of like still required to do some movement and stuff like that too it's a stage reading a stage 
stage rating. That's the term I think that's what it's used, where it's like, oh, it's staged, but it's also stage rating. So you still have movement, and all that stuff too. So it, it's odd to see that sort of thing work, but when it comes to your style of directing, or at least how'd you get into directing? Uh, yeah, how'd you get into directing? There we go. <laughs> yeah, so um, so I think, uh, you know, my advice on that is to, it's probably best for people to come into it either as a assistant director, an assistant stage manager or a stage manager. Um, when I first started out, I did a lot of assistant stage managing until I then became a stage manager. And then I was also doing a lot of assistant directing. Um, yeah. So I wasn't, I wasn't directing right away. Um, and then after assistant directing for people, they said, oh, do you wanna you know, direct uh, this smaller one act? And I was like, okay. And then I kept directing more things and more things. Um, but I think, you know, when I came to New York, I really didn't know anyone. I didn't have any friends. I didn't have any connections. Um, and I really did not know how to go about things. Um, but, you know, uh, I started assisting people and just anybody at all. And then from that, I kind of learned a little bit more about what was happening on the downtown theater scene and yeah. which groups I, I aspired to be a part of and which ones. The other thing I did is I literally saw everything I could see, especially if it was free. Uh, yes. And I actually well, tell the Planet Connection staff this every year when we have our, we have our big meeting. Um, I basically, you know, when I first got to New York, there was another theater festival that has since closed down, but was happening at the time. And the, they had maybe like 30 shows or something. And um, I and I was working at that festival and they said, you know, in exchange for work, you can see shows for free. Um, I literally saw all 30 shows. I would sit sometimes on Saturday and watch six of these shows back to back, mainly because I was trying to figure out like, who are the artists here that I wanna be working with? Like what's happening yeah. on downtown the scene? And I didn't know, so I just saw everything. And anytime I would see a playwright or a director or an actor that I thought was really good, I would wait for them after the show and I'd introduce myself and I'd ask if they would send me, email me a headshot or you know, email me a contact info. I'd love to assistant direct, love to stage manage, uh, love to just you know, send me what the next time you're in something. And so then I began to follow these people that I was interested in. And yeah. I would go and see a show that an actor was in that I like was just a downtown indie theater actor. And I'd wait after the show and I'd be like, oh, I saw you in this last show, really liked that show too. Yeah. Um, you know, and these things ended up leading to opportunities. Uh, but yeah, it was work and it was constant. And when that festival was happening, that first one, I think it only ran for like two, two to three weeks. Hmm. Um, and so I literally set aside two weeks or two to three weeks where I could see everything. And I just yeah. was nonstop. I was just nonstop. And I think that that honestly, that is part of um, how I've kept going is I am kind of nonstop. Um, so like, you know, even you mentioned the pandemic has happened yeah. and it was only like a few weeks into the pandemic before Planet Connections opened up on Zoom. And I think we were doing some of the first Zoom shows. Um, and I did not intend to found a Zoom festival, but what happened is a lot of the regular artists were kind of depressed because their shows had been canceled during the tech and they weren't able to perform. So I just said, well, we'll just do it online. And so before we knew it, we were doing that. And I think we were running for like a month before we realized we need an application and we need to start functioning more like how we function for the festival yeah. in, in real life. And so then we started <laughs> the application, but it's been a learning curve because we're in a pandemic. We don't want to charge money for, to the audience. So we're kind of doing pay what you can. There are just all these particulars to figure out about 
how, what was the best way to do it. And yeah. we actually stopped doing it for maybe like a month to kind of reset. Like recharge. And really, yeah, reset and also just think about it because when we started up the first round, we weren't thinking about it. We just wanted to help our friends who were depressed. Yeah. You know, it was like you were stopping people from drowning. You weren't worried about about the whole process of it. And then we realized, oh, we have to actually take our time and worry about it. And even now, um, like two weeks ago, we made some more updates to, to the application because we've been realizing as we going, as we're going, like, oh, we need to state X. Oh, actually it would be better if we did A instead of B. Like, oh, we're realizing these things. So yeah. I think everyone's in that learning curve phase. Um, and, um, you know, we are, we're doing the best that we can. Basically, though, I think Zoom is sort of a temporary thing yeah. to get people across the chasm of the pandemic until we're in a theater again. Um, so we just have been presenting as many people as we can. We present a new show every week. Um, I mean, at this point, since the pandemic started, I don't even know, but hundreds of artists have been presented at Planet online which is yeah crazy crazy to me because a year ago i didn't even know what zoom was <laughs> a year I, ago i i think <laughs> a year ago no one knew what zoom oh. was. <laughs> i had no idea what this was now now it's like these huge productions are happening i mean there's one that's happening this week um where it's all this puppetry and the director like shipped props to the actors and some of the actors are in like Seoul South Korea and some of them are in Thailand and some of them are here and I mean it's just a wild thing now because people are presenting more with international collaborators because yeah. we can we had a show last week where two of the actors were in Auckland you know like they're in Auckland New Zealand performing live this way you know so it's kind of been very interesting to see. And, um, you know, I don't know how it's all going to continue, but um, we're, we're going to be going through March and then taking a break to reevaluate again, you know, um, yeah, because, and also to rest, to rest because, because my staff needs to rest sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> a little break. Like, um, like I just don't like uh, it, when I was just like during the case, during the case of this filming, I just took a break for the holidays and put a break for the holidays for me because I was always a student. So my holiday break was like maybe a couple of weeks or so. I, t I yeah. took, I, I took practically, it took a month off from this show because I need, because one, I was also in the middle of working, working on for the holiday season. Pro yeah. Props to those who are working as a cashier. Okay. Like I was, you know, front yeah. cashier. Yeah are the unsung heroes of all this stuff going around. Yes. Uh, and <laughs> I knew going forward that if I had to do both my actual job and this job of mine, which is essentially a podcast, and I would be burnt out like considerably. And and that, that's another thing is that a lot, and that's another thing, especially with theater is that People could get burnt out on theater, especially if you're an actor, like after like maybe a couple of productions. There are people who are essentially working actors who could just like who, who could literally just jump and jump and jump to productions without no thing because they're just like so used to it by now. But there are, yeah. and this is something that you mentioned before, which is the artistry actors, where it's like there are people in this industry who want to be like a commercial actor right who do want to go on Broadway, right but in theater there is other things in theater that isn't just known for just being oh i want to be if people want to go into theater go into theater but if you do want to go into theater learn about you know what other theater roles you can do because it isn't just oh i want to be an actor on stage on broadway you know becoming uh, the fan of the opera, you know, eight times a week or something like that. Or I want to be on Broadway, you know, playing Gaston and uh, Beauty and the Beast on Broadway and so forth and so on. You know, you know there are people who want to be like the new Lynn, blah, blah, I'm always met, mixing up at, blah, Lynn Manuel Miranda, but people mm -hmm. forget, oh, he's been like really working his 
hash on for the past like maybe 20 years with you know stuff prior to uh hamilton and people was yep. like i want to write the new hamilton well if you want to write the new hamilton you really have to go back into the well of lynn's stuff and actually go oh you know and they recently did you know in the heights not only you know uh, as a movie but also that's like one of his thing you know that was one of his uh big things too and and before i even knew, yeah and before i knew about this you know last year i was doing my uh job at a uh, today ticks and we were doing not well a couple of years ago actually and one of his shows i found out that one, he was doing one of his other shows which was i believe uh, uh i forgot what it's called but it's sort of like uh some sort of like improv show where it's just like they dance, but also I forgot what it's called, but it's basically a show that he has produced for like maybe for the past like maybe 15 years or so, which is basically almost an improv to show where it's like they dance, they sing, they you know bring people from the audience, that sort of thing. And people like, you know, and there are people who was like, I want to create the new Hamilton and all that stuff. And it's like, and it actually does bring up a point where it's like, there are people who are go who go into theater who just want to become an actor, right? Mm-hmm. You think about Broadway or film or whatnot, and they forget mm-hmm. other you know things in theater that actually could be useful. You me- you mentioned stage managing. Stage managing is an incredible uh, profession to have. I know a lot of great stage managers. ASMs too. Uh, I work with a couple of assistant directors. I was an assistant director, I think, at least maybe once or twice. So it, it is very weird to know about, oh, you know, there's these other side jobs. I mean, not side jobs. There are other these there are other professions within theater. And and of course, there are people who do want to do theater and do want to do their uh uh activism in theater, and there are several performers who I know who are great activists and they always do great stuff in terms of not only raising awareness, but also just always being, always like owning up to our awareness is like, hey, this thing has always been around. And and there are actors who are like, oh, who are kind of like, I don't want to say are like, uh, what was it? Uh, like the flavor of the month activists, where it's like they just like do the thing for like a couple of weeks and then they just like stop, even though they don't really respect the cause and stuff like that too. And believe me, I've seen stuff like that too, where it's like, you know, I won't name names, but I've, like I've seen actors and actresses who like who do that and then immediately forget like maybe a week or two later. And then right as something would happen, they're like, oh yeah, remember this remember this charity or something like that i've been meaning to you know do and do such and such like that too so yeah it, it it's weird because when and again you know it's it's weird because the theater in new york city it's it's weird because it isn't just based off of broadway and you because you mentioned lower uh downtown theater which i didn't really expect to be like a bustling of things to know because I didn't realize there were a lot of theaters downtown that have like rich history, you know. There's a uh, Gra- uh, Grand Nixon Place. Uh, th- yeah, there's Nixon Place. I believe that's what it's called. Yeah, Nixon Place. There's La Mamba. There is uh, several other places. So it- it's weird how people, when they do go in the theater, right, they automatically think, oh, Broadway. But there's always off Broadway and there's always off off Broadway. And yeah, again, sorry folks for going into a little spiel or rant about that, but it's just like one of those things where it's just like, I just have to say it on my chest because there are people who go into theater and immediately think, oh, I just want to come an actor, that sort of thing too. When there are dozens and dozens and dozens of people who work the same mindset of you and they're working other jobs like what you just said before which is you know yeah assistant well director. i think some of the some of the more interesting artists that i've come across have been people who have uh jumped between all of these different worlds yeah um, when you look at someone like um 
like Tanya Pinkins or Philip Seymour Hoffman or Cherry Jones, Ethan Hawke. These are all performers who sometimes perform on the downtown indie theater scene in a little black pop somewhere and also sometimes perform on Broadway and also sometimes perform in television and also sometimes perform in film and do a Hollywood thing. And then it'll just pop up in some downtown, you know, less than 99 seat black box uh, again, uh, but, you know, and run a show down there. So there are people, I mean, Austin Pendleton is another one who jumps around like that. Um, and I think also, you know, in Tanya Pinkins case, she's someone who performs internationally a good deal. So, you know, or, or Eric N is another person, um, but a lot of people work internationally yeah. uh, as well as, here. and it does kind of affect um, who they are as artists and people. And uh, there's a lot of complex complexity to them as creators. Um, that artists who just work in one bubble world of commercial yeah. theater or just in one bubble world of downtown theater, like they don't have that same kind of nuance of complexity. Um, it's like so what I was saying. I yeah, sorry. It's like what I was saying before. There are those actors who could just who could just jump and jump and jump and work and work and work and not feel any different uh, because they could do downtown theater and then they could do Broadway theater and then they could just go back to downtown theater. It's just like, it's like a whole different beast. It is. And there, there are artists who love to work that day, that way, they'll do a national tour and then they'll come down and do some sort of experimental play. Uh, and then they'll hop, hop back across the fence. Um, I mean, you do tend to make more money in commercial theaters. So I saw Cherry Jones actually do an interview about this once. And she mentioned how she would work on, you know, in commercial theater to make money. And then she'd yeah. hop across the fence and just go do something just for the love of it uh, on the indie theater scene or, or somewhere else, uh, you know, regionally or wherever. But basically just because it was a role she wanted to play or a collaborator she wanted to be with or just because that was a play she really liked a lot, um, but it wasn't really a money-making job. And then you kind of like hop back across the fence to the commercial theater realm and you gotta make the money and do the money, do the money, money, money. And then you kind of hop back and, you know, so that was the way yeah. that she described it for herself. That's not necessarily how it is for all of these, all of the people I've previously mentioned. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, there's something to be said for that. Some people like to create that way and live that way. I think an artist's career has many journeys. Um, yeah. You know, one of my, the people I was trained with by was Liz Suedos. Um, and she had started at La Mama and she had eventually left the community because her career was leading her in a different direction uh, is what she stated to me. And, you know, at that point she had written uh, Runaways and, you know, she was moving to Broadway. She was doing these other things. And then it was many years later. I mean, I don't think she worked at La Mama for quite, quite some time. Um, and then it's like 10, 20 years later, you know, towards the end of her life, she had begun to work there again and circle back to this place that had, had nurtured her in her youth, but had not been part of the whole 20, 30 year journey of her career. Yeah. Um, and so that can sometimes happen with people too. Um, but of course, La Mama is a different place now than it was back when it was in the seventies when, you know, Liz Suedos was probably starting out. So um, everything is kind of shifting, ebbing, flowing. That's normal, you know? And um and now that you mentioned the name La Mamba, and I know that that place has like a special meaning to you, both as a theater artist, but also as a patron, uh, yeah, a patron of theater. So, how did you get into La Mamba theater just on the regular? Because I was actually because it's weird because. A few years ago, before I did your thing, I actually was an usher for a La Mamba play. Uh, I think it was I think it was like my hardest to the east or something like that. And 
doing that play for at least two weeks as an usher. And, and I had to look up like where this theater was because I never heard of it. Because one, I never actually journeyed downtown before. I mean, I mean, yeah. downtown, it's like, oh, it's usually like, sorry, back or something like that. I never actually journeyed downtown, which was like the Lower East Side. That's like downtown Manhattan for me now. It's like, oh, there's like, whenever I go to, whenever someone goes, oh, I'm going downtown Manhattan, there's like, all right, there's like, there's two downtowns for me. It's like, do you mean downtown Tribeca? Or do you mean like downtown where it's like the Lower East Side, that sort of thing? And I remember looking up La Mamba and I'm like, wow, this place has been around since like the sixties. I'm like, oh my God, like, how is it? I never actually, uh, you know, how is it that I've never actually seen a play here? And, and I'm looking up all this stuff about this history. I'm like, wait, 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 all these actors who I know of actually acted here and stuff like that too. And I'm like, and I remember seeing an interview with, I believe Reggie, uh, Reggie Clark. I mean, I might be pronouncing his last name. I'm sorry, uh, but he was talking about La Mamba and talking about the 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 back and the history, the rich history of it. And I'm like, this is actually a good place to actually not only and and I was and afterwards I was like, you know what, this is actually might be a good place to, if you ever needed to do like an off Broadway. Th- thing that was like in downtown this will be like one of the good places to do especially because of the rich history it has so how did you get into not only working for there i mean not working for there i mean producing the work there but also just i know it has theater a retreat of sorts i might be wrong but because you posted about this many times before about how you go into La Mama treats and run your plays there too. So yeah. It's- uh, yes, yes, yes. Okay. So, um, well, first off, my first encounter with La Mama, I was very young. I was a props mistress, uh, for a theater. This is back when I was sort of a teenager, um, out in New Jersey. Uh, and I, you know, was working there in the summer. And I, um, I had been sent into La Mama to pick up props from a clo- show that was closing and bring them out to the New Jersey theater uh, that needed them. Um, and so that was actually, you know, when I met Ellen Stewart and I didn't know that she was Ellen Stewart at the time. Yeah. Um, but that did become clear over the course of the conversation. <laughs> and she was um, pretty adamant with me at the time um, that she thought I should go to La Mama Umbria, which is a, a program that La Mama does in Umbria. And she was also adamant about several other things uh, to the point where I was a little kind of weirded out by her because I was still a kid yeah. and she was t- very fast and she was very like animated and I was like I don't know who this person is and um she actually insisted that I take a tour of the theaters and there was someone else there who ended up taking me on a tour of all of the venues of La Mama before I left uh with these props um anyway I kind of left that whole encounter thinking to myself like I don't know who that crazy woman was but I never looked into it I never looked into La Mama Umbria. I did not pursue La Mama. um, And many, many, many years went past. And um, much later on in my career, um, I was looking for ways to get into directing and strengthen my skill sets. And I was applying to several different programs. And uh, I ended up applying to La Mama Umbria Although what was interesting is actually my computer um, wasn't printing. I had a house guest, my friend Maureen, and she fixed my my printer while I was away, printed the application and put it in the mail. Yeah. And I had not, because I'd been trying to print it before I left and it wouldn't print. And then I was like, uh, you know, I don't need to do La Mama Umbria. It's okay. <laughs> I just, yes. And then she ended up sending it in the mail. And and was like, and she, well, I got back from work and she was like, yeah, I fixed your printer and I put the application in, so you're good. 
And I was like, oh, thank you. Okay. <laughs> and then I ended up getting accepted. Um, one of the reasons I had applied to go was because I was interested also in working with Liz Suedos, who was teaching that year, uh, because she did a lot of theater and activism and I was doing a lot of theater and activism. And so I thought it would be a good opportunity. Um, so I went out to train and there were several other people there. In fact, Marco Calvani, was one of our teachers and he ended up becoming one of my good friends and still is and just did one of the Zoom shows last month actually. Um, and you know, he's a wonderful human being. Um, and uh, yeah, so then I ended up uh, wanting to go back, uh, but I uh, switched to playwriting uh, and training as a playwright, which is predominantly what I started doing there over the years. Um, and so I trained with a number of, of different playwrights. And of course, that's where I met Eric N. He was my teacher and has become, you know, one of my mentors and, uh, and great collaborators uh, throughout the years. Um, and I think that, um, you know, for me, when you're living out there at La Mama Umbria, it's a very special time and you really do eat breathe breathe sleep with these with these people you know you wake up you have breakfast with them you train with them you have lunch with them you train with them again you have dinner with them you have some wine at night we all go to you have a roommate so one of my fellow students was you know I shared a room every year with someone um so I think that uh it really was just um just a very special, wonderful place. And it's also the place where Ellen Stewart's ashes are interned. Oh, wow. Uh, there is a chapel up at the top of the hill there and that's where her ashes are interned. Um, but they have an open air stage. They have several studios. They have a cappuccino maker, which is wonderful. You can make yourself a little cappuccino. Um, and of course there's just the magic of being in Italy and being surrounded by that. Um, the whole program was founded uh, by David Diamond and Ellen Stewart, and now that Ellen has passed on, David and Mia run the program uh, with Adriana, who is um, one of their Italian artist collaborators out there. Hmm. Uh, but yeah, it's a very special place. Um, a lot of artists are always coming by, saying hello, um, stopping in for dinner. So, you know, you meet a lot of people there. Um, in a sort of casual, comfortable way. And um, for me, I mean, it's where I've written all of my plays, actually the rough drafts have all been from there. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it just feels, uh, you know, the food's so good, the food's delicious. And then there's just this warm, welcoming energy to the place. Um, so, there's a special bond between people who are who have trained at La Mama Umbria. Um, eventually that led into me working in New York uh, with Eric N on his productions in La Mama uh, specifically. Um, and we, you know, presented a, a show there that went very well. And uh, you know, we've continued to collaborate. I've directed a few of his other pieces since then. And then uh, now I sometimes am able to ask Mia if I might do an, a project of my own just uh, here and there. And so we did do one a couple of years ago um, that she gave us a slot for, so. Uh, but yeah, a lot of my fellow collaborators, even now, you know, we have a, an event coming up in February with Planet Connections on Zoom and uh, Eric N wrote for it and so did Catherine Fiu um, and a lot of other La Mama type people are involved. So hmm. it's kind of... Uh, uh, so could you give us like a quick little detail about working at the thing, uh, at at uh, La Mamba, uh, how do you pronounce it? Um, uh, Umbria? Umbria, yeah, there we go. Uh, yes, well, anybody can apply to be a part of it. You just go to their website 
and uh, you can apply um, online to do La Mama Umbria. They didn't do it this last year, or they did do it over Zoom, but it's not the same thing. Yeah. Because, um, you really don't have the experience of being there. So I'm not sure when it will reopen for people. Um, but yeah, but you know, every time is different because it's a different group and it, every time has a different teacher. So every experience is different. Uh, but I do think anyone who uh, has the ability and the time to train there should go at least once in their lives for one semester. I think it's be very beneficial. It did really shift where I was at and, and just me as a person, definitely. <laughs> Now, when you mentioned you, you mentioned yeah, you mentioned you wrote a couple of your rough drafts or your plays there. Uh, is it basically like okay, I have my computer here. There's no Wi-Fi. I'm just gonna write with my other uh, other classmates here, or is it just basically like almost like taking a class where it's like we have people read the rough draft and stuff like that too, or is it just like what you just said before? Each year is essentially different different every time different every time because a different teacher means the structure of how we're learning is different um so with eric n who was my first playwriting teacher there there were a lot of exercises and we did several different types of exercises and in fact a lot of those exercises that we did i have i sometimes use them when i'm directing um and in fact, a lot of my training, I mean, I did a whole section there with the Belarus Theater Company and a lot of the exercises that we did with Belarus Theater Company, I still use as a director um, now. But I think, um, yeah, you know, it's, it's training by different master artists and every gotcha. master artist is different. So the way that Belarus Theater Company trains is completely, completely different from how Eric N trains, you know? Yeah. Those are two totally different ways of going about the process and two totally different energies. Um, but you are exposed to that training straight for two to four weeks, depending on the length of stay you elect to be there for. Um, and, you know, some of the training is more linear, some of it's more experimental, some of it's international. Mm. Um, you know, it's all over the the place sometimes they have puppeteers come in and they do puppeteer training um everything's different you know so but uh but yeah i really fit well and i wasn't expecting that when i went i wasn't thinking to myself like this is going to be one of my theater communities i basically was just really excited about los suedos um but that led me into oh actually this is um this is for me and so now i just think maybe ellen stewart was right about all those things she said to me back when i was a kid because as it turns out <laughs> i do really like la mama umbria and i do really like david diamond so <laughs> she, she got some of it right so i'm like is the rest of this gonna be true too <laughs> like <laughs> so we'll see we'll see uh so I don't have any more, I, a lot more questions, but I do have one last question and it's something that you brought up before, which is theater and activism. And you mentioned that you were a theater activist. Theater act? I can't, I can't, uh, I can't make up that word. Uh, you mentioned you were a theater activist. Uh, do you see theater becoming a lot more invested in it? Because, and this is, has been a problem this, well, this has been a problematic for a theater for the past, like say, <laughs> forever, where it's just like there are things in theater that are still problematic, but still people don't want to say, don't want to put their foot down because, you know, like you said before, you know, they, they want to have that job, so they want to keep that job, that sort of thing, where it's just like, do you see, uh, but I think what I'm trying to say is, do you see theater becoming a lot more activism, activism act, uh, a lot more with being an act, uh, th there's a lot more active, active, you, yeah. you know what I'm trying to say. 
Yeah. yeah. Um, listen, <laughs> all different types of theater have been done for thousands of years. Um, you know, you go back to the ancient Greeks and you're looking at some of these plays. Some of them were uh, meant to develop humanity within other people. So how do we begin to see something from someone else's perspective? Well, we see that by seeing a theater show about it back then or seeing a television show about it. Um, that helps me learn like, oh, this is what, you know, what it's like to exist in such and such a culture and place. Like I'm watching a television show about that. Um, and so this really educates us. It makes it easier for us to put ourselves in someone else's shoes, um, which ultimately hopefully prevents, uh, you know, war is a very yeah. horrible, bad thing that, you know, we should aspire to prevent. Um, but we always are seem to be on the teetering edge of every time. Of it. And so artists, I think, need to work as much as they can for um, for developing humanity and empathy within people from all backgrounds and all uh, cultures. And artists actually have always been doing that, whether they are artists working in Indonesia or whether they are artists working at the West End in London or whether they are artists working in uh, in Morocco, they are, no matter what continent or country, um, there are people out there who are working to help develop humanity, which is, which is something the arts hopefully does. Now, in our culture, in um, the United States, uh, we turned into how can artists make us money? It became a business, right? Yeah. And this is part of what you're talking about. Like, do you say something uh, to someone, um, you know, or not, or what, what, or do you just keep your head down? Uh, you know, these are all personal choices. I, and it, this is a complex situation that I don't have all the, the answers to. I mean, yeah, it, it's, again, it's like one of those things where it's, it's been around since theater has been born, really. And, you know, like just last year, I just mentioned this on my last episode, where it's like just last year, one of the big one of the big problematic things was that oh, West Side Story was being practically in the news for one of the cast members being you know something like that. Had something had happened. Something right. had happened with other yeah. you know people in the past, and the you know, production was like they didn't want to like toss around people or something like that too, and now it's like. Mm -hmm. It's, well, like year, it's like a year later, no one, and like the only thing people care about theater is like, oh man, you know, they have a Ratatouille musical now. It's like, it, it's like. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. always shifting. It's always yeah. shifting. And well, theater, all of these, all of these situations are complex and they have different sides to them. And yeah. we may, we may not have all the information. And I think that that's important to understand. Um, whenever I read anything, whether it's on social media or whether it's in the news, um, I like to, do, to attempt to look a little deeper, you know, yeah. into what might be going on. Um, so I don't, I don't know, you know, how to answer all of this, but I will say that I'm not a fan of the cancel culture. Um, yeah. I don't think that that is a successful way to make the changes that you want to make in another human being or in an organization. Yeah. I think that I'm a big proponent of the call in culture. So when you have an issue with someone, you call them in. Oh, uh, okay. To your, to your circle, to your phone to your how, zoom call right now um, and make them own um, and make them own up to their bullshit yeah or just ask them about it i don't know if i would say make it make them own up to it but i would say a discussion is better than yeah. 
public humiliation. Public humiliation tends to make people defensive. Yeah. Um, but a discussion might help shift things. However, it's important to know that not everyone can be changed with a public with a, with a discussion either. Yeah. However, um, it's important to never exile someone, but instead to leave a seat open at the table for the person in case they do come back two years later and say, you know what, it's taken me a while to realize what you were talking about a couple of years ago, but now I see that. Yeah. And, you know, my work organization is willing to shift or I'm willing to shift or whatever the situation is um and I think that that's that's important for how we're developing yeah if you come in on the attack like you just run these new articles like we've all got to cancel I guess West Side Story is what you mentioned West Side Story right although yeah. I've seen a number of things where people feel they really have to cancel uh the flea or like whatever they got cancel this this week you know, every week there's something new we have to cancel um i feel like uh you know if it's possible for people to sit down and talk it through um that might be the best case scenario and if it's not keep a seat at your table open for that person later they might change their mind in a couple months after they've calmed down and thought about things a little bit yeah you know? and i think for the most part especially and it's weird because it's because of what's been happening with the pandemic you know not only theater but the entertainment world in general has been essentially i think owning up to some of these mistakes or at least trying to own up to these mistakes and having Difficult discussions they've been not wanting to talk about maybe in their in their lifetime, but in this lifetime of ours, there have to be discussions where it's just like, oh, you know, it's like mm -hmm. right before I left uh, my college, you know, right before I graduated from college, there was talk about adding, you know, BIPOC staff members and and also using BIPOC and actual like BIPOC uh, stories plays, directors, that sort of thing too. And yeah. it's a lot more difficult to do that when, when, like you just said before, it's more about the draw power of say one person. When say, you know, using this as an example, say Idris Elba is starring in a production of uh, Waiting for Godot, right? And his co-star, let's just say Adam X or something like that, is a known per you know known person to have fight with people behind the scenes that sort of thing. But people still go see these two people because one, it's each Jalber, and also Adam X also bring sure. up brings up people to go and actually see this person because no matter how horrible the person is behind the scenes, they're still willing to go see this person in theater or in concert or whatever because of their drawing power and and for the past like say a few years or so and this has been going on more than a few years but there's people who have been owning up to these mistakes and there's people who haven't been owning up to these mistakes and theater for some reason has always been that blind eye uh that turns a blind eye almost like religiously where it's just like we know about your mistakes in the past, so but we don't care about your mistakes in the past. We only care about the people who you bring in. So in the end, it's like what you've said before is that theater has become a business of making money as opposed to being a business, well, not business, a, a non theater has become a business has become a business to make money rather than a theater has become a business to entertain and actually make people actually think and actually think about you know you know topics and stuff like that too because yes. I through uh productions you know friends uh you know friends of mine productions you know professional productions and at the end and 
And at the end, if they're allowing me to actually think to think about the themes I've talked, I mean, seen or stuff I've learned about in that play, I'm like, it make me go, wow, I gotta really rethink my life. Mm-hmm. That's, you know, good theater, but. Well, I think there's a difference uh, between someone who's difficult to get along with and someone who is physically assaulting people and like has some sort of trap on their office door where they lock people in and assault them, right? Yeah. Um, There's different types of things. And what's not helpful is to lump in an artist who might've been really just moody one day or- Yeah. um, or during a particular creative process was just not easy to deal with. Yeah, because Lump that person in with an actual person who's assaulting people, these yeah. are very different things. You know, it's sort of like we can't we can't punish someone for stealing a loaf of bread the same way that we punish someone who has murdered 18 people. Yeah. These are two totally different crimes. And right now, what I see is a lot of like, let's lump this all into one thing. So you have the person who stole the loaf of bread punished the same as the person who, you know, uh, killed 18 people, okay? Yeah, it's- I think that it's important to understand that. It's also important to understand that people can change. They can grow. They might have been in a criminal, been in the prison system, been a really a bad person in the prison system and then come out on the outside and meet other people and shift and change and grow and not be who they used to be. This is possible. People are evolving as human beings. So I don't think people should be punished now for things they did 20 years ago. Yeah. Um, That was them 20 years ago. I mean, I'm not the same person person now as I was three years ago so I can only imagine when I'm going to be 20 years from now you know we're in evolution and we have the ability to influence and help people um, again have more compassion have more empathy have more understanding Uh, and so I think um, yeah as artists we continue to do that and we hope for hope for the best but it's important to understand that you can't you can't influence everybody in this way. That's not possible. Um, But you do the best with the situations that are at your table. Um, And that's really all we can do, I think. But all of these things will continue. Commercial theater will continue. There will always be people who are not so great. Um, Tom Cruise apparently will really yell at you if you don't wear a mask. I don't know if you heard that thing. Uh, among other things, but you know. You know, among other things, okay. <laughs> like, and part of the reason that this is, though, it's because artists are temperamental people. And this is something that it took me a little while to learn, and so I will mention it. Um, you know, I have been so blessed and fortunate to work with as many of the brilliant artists that I have worked with in my career. Some of them renowned, some of them not so renowned, you know? But I can tell you that across the board, they are emotional charges of energy. And that is how they create the work. That is how they do the the job. So if they're like a little crazy one day, I don't take it so personally because I know that they have to be in a certain place and revved up in a certain way in order to deliver the performance or in order to deliver the design or in order to deliver the play, the script, okay? So that's just them doing the work and getting the thing out. They're, They're giving birth to something. It's, that's the best way I can say. So if they're screaming and crying while they're giving birth, I'm not taking that personally. They're giving birth. Yeah. Okay. I yeah. think that like that's something <laughs> one has to work out. When someone is giving birth, they yell, they scream, they're like, I hate you to their husband. Okay. That's not how they really feel. That's them giving birth. When yeah, they're it- done, when they're done giving birth, 
then you can have like a reasonable conversation with them about like, hey, next You time really you hate me? Know. No, I was just, that, that was just the important. That was, that just was me, like, true. Uh, so I think- That was just the drugs, okay. You know, but also while they're giving birth is not the time to address your issue with them. While they're giving birth, they're giving birth. They can't think about what issue you have with them, you know? So you can address those issues after the child is born. Uh, when they are feeling a little bit better. Um, but yeah, like this whole idea that that everyone is going to be perfect, no one's going to be perfect. Cuomo yeah. is not a perfect person, you know, but he does a very good job the majority of the time. So cool. Okay. Um, I don't need everybody around me to be perfect. I don't need everybody to, you know, um, to be 100% right 100% of the time. Bosses are not always right and bosses are not perfect. Leaders aren't always perfect. Yeah. Nobody is, employees are not perfect, you know? But if someone is basically doing it 70% of the time, like let's just be happy and move on with our lives and not dwell on the one or two things that they weren't so great at, you know? Um, forgiveness, I think is a big part of what the culture needs right now. It's learning yeah. how to forgive people for not being perfect. And so again, though, it, there are people who actually are murdering people and assaulting them. And those people, yes, we need to do something and we need to have some structure in place. They can't just go around doing that as they please. Yeah. Um, but overall, I mean, if someone was uh, yelling and screaming while they were giving birth, oh well, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that was it. <laughs> and on that note, I think that's a good way to end my episode with you, Kalori. Uh, thank you for joining me today. Oh, three last quick questions are fairly easy. Uh, one, do you have any advice to those who are emerging artists right now, especially those who are actors, playwrights, producers, directors, especially going through what appears to be year, the first, uh, what appears to be year two of no Broadway or something like that. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's going to come back. So we all need to like stay on our training. Um, do, do your, your actor work. I mean, this is for young actors, keep your voice ready, keep your body ready. Um, because it will come back. Um, but, uh, know that um that it will be a long time and that's okay and hopefully this time has given everyone um a moment to explore other things they like you know or other things they might not have had time for take a class i myself am taking a class in television writing right now i hmm. never thought that i would be writing uh television but I've just decided, you know, I, that's a skill set that I want to have, whether I, I elect to attempt to go into that or not. Um, so, you know, new skills are good, uh, whatever they may be. And uh, eventually we will come back and things will continue. Um, and so just keep walking across the bridge. It's a bridge across this pandemic chasm. And yeah. we, have, we all got to keep you know, walking across it. Sooner or later, it'll come back to you. But anyway, uh, my second question is, do you have any social media that you want to plug? You know, uh, websites, YouTube? Yeah, people should come to our Zoom Fest, uh, www.planetconnections.org. We do a new show every night, 7.30 p.m. We have hundreds of different artists. People also can still apply to be a part of the Zoom Festival if they have scripts or something that they want to do. Uh, there's an application online. And um, yeah, feel free to come by, see a show, and uh, introduce yourself afterwards. We allow everybody to turn on their cameras after the show is done and to talk with the artist and hang out with us. And so anyone can do that and it's free. And my last question is, I think you just mentioned it before, but do you have any uh, uh, work do you want to promote that are that is coming up in the future? I, you just mentioned the, the Zoom Fest, but do you have any other things that isn't uh, Zoom related? 
Um, I no, I'm really doing things within the Zoom Fest. Like I, I am working on this thing with love is what it's called with Eric N and Jose Rivera, Lyle Kessler, Regina Taylor, Catherine Fiu, Mark Jason Williams, Drew Laramore. Oh my gosh, there's so many writers. Okay, um, <laughs> sorry to everybody I didn't mention. Um, but yes, yeah, so we are gonna be doing that next month. And it's kind of poetry, um, short monologues. Desi Moreno Penson wrote one. And Dana Bowl did uh, some choreography for it. And Kira Bowie is a visual designer who's working with us. It's gonna be a really great piece, I think. And I'm, I'm looking forward to it. And uh, so I'm directing that. And then Ooh. I, yeah, yeah. So it's pretty cool. And um, yeah, pretty much my stuff is Zoom. Maybe in the summer, we might do some outdoor theater, something I'm thinking about. Uh, but that's the summer, you know, it's summer. People outdoors and more people are getting the, the, vaccine. the vaccine. The vaccine, yeah. So, so that's happening. So, yes, that has been episode eight, I believe. Yeah, episode eight of Performing the Arts season four. I've lost count of how many episodes I've already done, but Gloria, <laughs> thank you again for just dropping by and just talking about your you. for theater life, you know, and, and theater work in general, theater experience. It's good to know that sometimes all you need to do in order to get to theater is just to talk to someone in theater without really realizing about what theater is. And with that, see you all next time.